And today, Christine Lashley has a list for you about painting. Christine, what is it? Oh, it's a great list, Eric. You're going to want to tape it to your easel. It's going to be a list of top five things to improve your landscape paintings. Top and we're going to go through things, it together. Top five things to improve your landscape painting. Yep. Well, let's get to it. And Christine, you are doing watercolor. Uh, this is very unusual <laughs> as, as far as I know. I know. Hold on to your hat there, Eric, because I do both and I love I love what both media can do. Uh, watercolor and oil, I feel, talk together and I feel that one informs the other as to giving me ideas about melding color. I mean, look at what watercolor can do. It's just fantastic. So I like to work out a lot of my ideas plein air. And I wanted to bring up the first tip, which was no equal intervals for our top tips for landscape. So maybe if we looked at the uh, Potomac Reflections video or graphic that we have, we could take a look at our top tip for shapes. That's great. So in this one, you could see that I have an equal potential for my trees. How can I make each tree equal yet slightly different? So just by varying your shape, you can start to improve your landscape. And then the second tip is... Wait, 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 wait. wait. You're not getting away that soon. You can take it slow, <laughs> take a deep breath. Okay. I want to understand this a little bit more. Yes. So uh, start from scratch here. Tell us what your what the first tip is. You are saying vary your shapes? Yes, basically just vary your shapes. And no equal intervals means that you can use that for any component of your painting. So that means, for example, if you have a lot of green, then you need some areas with less green. If you have a lot of dark shapes, that means you should have some light shapes. In the case of that example, I had a lot of trees so we could quite simply look at the idea of how would you vary a shape. So we're talking about uh, basic steps. You know, if I have a shape like this, it's going to be better than a shape like this for a tree because this one is slightly varied and this one is not. So therefore you could just plan on always varying your shapes. And then if I have these two shapes, I could also be thinking about the space in between and therefore maybe my next tree is going to be something possibly like this that has like a tree hole in it and maybe maybe a companion shape here. So now we have three different things. One thing we that... tend to do, Christine, is we tend to line things up. One of my early instructors said, you, may, you tend to make your trees like a bunch of soldiers standing in a row. Exactly. Uh, you know, they're, they're all at the same height. They're all the same distance between them. Group yep. things a little bit, make things overlap. Exactly. That's exactly it. And this, you're right. They're all the same height. So the division in between and the height of the individuals and where they're lining up to make that all slightly varied is going to be a good deal. And uh, so that's basically the idea of no equal intervals. Um, and I, I find that to be the most basic way of understanding uh, value. Let's just call it like it is, because it could be mostly the eye is going to read value first. So we're talking about silhouette is a good way of thinking about this. Okay, so I'm going to just challenge you here for a second. Okay. Because that's my job, you know. <laughs> you, um, you do there, it. There are, right. people, there are people who are watching this that don't know what value is. So let's let's bring it down a notch and make sure everybody understands that. I think that's a great idea. So let's pull up the uh, screenshot graphic where you could see my thumb holding up the value. So here I did a little study on location, and it's a watercolor study. And you could see my oil is off to the left. I'm preparing to do an oil painting. So I have this study where I was studying mid-tone greens and how how what was the value of the mid-tone green and 
how did the color slightly vary? And I was curious about that. And I set out just to paint that mid distance. And you can see right near my thumb, I have established the value there. This is how you read a value scale. You could do this while you're on location or you could do it back at the studio. Or guess what, Eric? You could do this from your favorite book of awesome paintings. And that's what I did. I looked at Edgar Payne. Uh, John F. Carlson talks about value in the landscape. And so to understand this mid distance, I didn't feel like I was getting, um, you know, good results, or I, I guess I was hungry for more information and to have this as more fluid knowledge and to really understand it. And also Eric be able to manipulate that. So therefore this study is important to me. I keep it taped to my studio wall and you can see I've established this as mid value and I squint at it. That's how you can kind of understand where the eye needs to go with that so mid value. which one would you consider is the thumb where the thumb is, is what you consider yeah. mid value? Yes, exactly. Because you could see the darker one to the right. If you see that U shape, that kind of like, what is that purple mid distance color? I find students often have trouble with that color and and getting the right value for that color. So I, I would say it's right where my thumb is, because if you squint, it should diminish the, the color that is uh, that your eye is reading and things get simplified into more value. And that's ha that's a good tip for understanding value on location or when you're looking at artwork. Okay, so you're well prepared. Do us a favor, Christine, would you pull your pad down just a little bit? The camera's cutting it off. Yeah, sure, you bet. There you go. How's that? All right, good. I know, I was, I have, I was all set up and then, um, yeah, anyway, here we are. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> So basically, now what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do just to make a demonstration for everybody, because I want to I want to make sure there's good clarity. Do me a favor. Uh, draw a horizon line. Now, put uh, like six trees all in a row, same height, same space apart. I, f I feel I have this power. I'm able to direct I know, one of the world's I, great I, painters. Well, people definitely know this is live. Okay, so oh yeah, we're in we're in Tuscany. We're looking at cypress trees. All right, now okay, so there's cypress trees, and there's there's a little uh, villa on the hill in the background. Now I made a mistake on that one. <laughs> that's all right. Now do the same thing, but do it the way you would group it so that you keep it from being boring. Exactly, this is good. And also notice what I did here, same value for my ground plane. So that's all types of not good. So now we're gonna introduce variety here. We're going to make this one a bit taller with maybe some arms coming out. I'm also going to separate this out as to this is the ground plane or the grass in front. And now this is going to be darker. Maybe this one's extra tall. This one's fatter. And this one is kind of bushy. Okay, yeah, so and, now and then if you some... wanted to, you could actually do a little grouping where you you uh, put something behind one of the trees, just barely peeking through, or something even even at a lower value. So I exactly. think that's a that's a great demonstration because it's a it's a common problem all early stage painters go through, and sometimes we all do it and we don't even realize it. It's really good to just double check that, and I I think part of the issue is that. This is so simple that you might leaf through that in a book or skip through that in a video and be like, oh yeah, well, of course. But it's harder when you're standing in the field and let's say we're in Tuscany and you know you only have two hours to paint, you're not really gonna be thinking about this bare basic stuff. You're gonna be wanting to try to get the whole scene in and be really excited about, I know, but the green was special. And then I saw lavender and 
the clouds were so beautiful. So it's hard to stay focused on this one simple thing, but this is how you do it by slowing down and thinking about the silhouette as to no equal intervals. And you sure. can see that they're still interspersed, but I have the negative shape, which is the shape in between as different. And then the actual shape or the object itself, which is different as well. Yeah. Well, let's go to Tuscany and paint. I'm in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think so too. I'm ready. Okay, so the second tip is going to be to create a Z versus a C. And that quite simply means a lot of people have trouble with roads. And since, uh, well, since we're in Tuscany, Eric, yeah. if we have a road that does this, it's you might see this in the landscape, but usually what I do is I zigzag it up. I introduce some kind of jig jag to the shape. And here, let's just have my, let's, let's have this unequal. So I gotta remember my first rule. And this is two equal. So I wanna widen that road a little bit. And this is going to help people that are struggling with perspective or just how, and this is why I like to work in the watercolor. It just kind of lifts right out. It's nice. Anytime you have a, a real straight line, like if you look at right there on the right before where you have not smudged it out, uh, your eye gets drawn there because you have a sharp edge. Anytime you have a sharp edge or something really straight, uh, that's, that's one thing to draw your eye. Exactly. That's exactly right. And now we could go right into, even though this is mostly black and white, we could go right into um, my fade idea, which uh, I also have a painting that is, it looks like it's all very soft grays, but, but we'll just finish this spot here for a minute. So if I have a slight fade idea, that just means quite simply that I have the Let's say I have this a little bit yellow, this goes back. So I have a, a gradation that is happening here. So anytime you can introduce a gradual gradation, and that could be color, that could be value, such as what is starting to happen here. So is that our third tip? Yep, so three is fade or shift. Fade or shift. Okay, let's go back over uh, the first, the second one was C or Z. Would you on your paper show me a C and show me a Z? I just want to make sure we reiterate for everybody. Yep, you bet. And then we'll do we'll go back into this one. So so that type of shape is rarely present in the landscape. And if possible, it's good to minimize this. So instead of a C, I like to be thinking of a Z or some type of zigzag shape. Yeah. And, and so even if this is really curved, I would probably jag this up a little bit, make yeah. it a bit ragged. So no to C, we'll put a big red X through there. Okay. All right, the Ghostbusters sign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. And actually, so. if we could pull up the, uh, the ocean example, I have the, the fade and I have the Z versus the C. For that. Let's hold on to that there. So let's let's just go through here. What um, to explain what the different markings are that you have. So let's well, sure. do fade first. Okay. Uh, well, let me explain also why I chose this image. Um, I chose this image because there are such subtle transitions and it looks very busy. But behind the you know the the master pulling the strings here is value. And so that's what makes the painting work. And that's what helps me work with all of these ins and outs and shifts and makes it look like, you know, foam and all of that stuff happening. So value is the hidden component here. And that goes back to our master tips, which would, you could see no two uh, equal intervals. So I was thinking about that within all of that equality. So next we get to some of the graphics and the markings I have on there. And that is the Z versus the C is in red. So your first thought might be, look at those round, like 
lily paddle shapes, you know, of the waves coming up. And it's a, it's an easy tendency to kind of embellish that. But instead, I've marked in red how I was thinking about jagging that up, how, how I could make that a little bit more zigzaggy. And that was the underpinning of the design there. And uh, then we look at the arrows that are showing the fade of color. And we haven't quite got to that, but this is where we exit the baby steps of value as to silhouette. And we're going to be talking about now how to manipulate value optically, which is pretty exciting stuff. So your arrow in the sky, it's the sky is fading from darker to lighter. Yes, but it's also fading a little bit in color to the right is a little bluer. And then as it gets towards the sun, I'm warming it up. Okay, so, so that fade, would be it can be in color or it can be in value. Right. So no All two right. intervals the same can be a shift in color. And this is going to be part of our next idea that we're talking about, which is that four and five are because value and advanced value is it, it's just so rich with possibility. Uh, we're going to be talking about value groups and value equality, same value shift the color. And if we pull up the graphic that shows the uh, value chart plus the, uh, I don't know if they, they have that graphic. But basically, there's ways to kind of parse out your value. And it's really fantastic because in the demo that uh, I wanted to show you guys, I want to I wanted is, to do is this. Is this the one? Is this the graphic? Yes, that's exactly it. All right. OK, talk us through it. Sure. So value grouping is basically you decide what's my point of interest and is my subject light, is my subject dark? So here it was the trees against the light sky. And then what I did was in the upper left quadrant of that illustration, you could see that was in watercolor and I did the light grouping of the sky. So that is the same color in the light value grouping, but I've shifted the chromatic range of that color. So same value shift the color. And then you could see where I've written medium, the ground plane and the sky shadow or the sky cloud accent is in that midtone. Uh, so those are two elements that basically are both in the medium range and those are a pair. And then the dark is simply the, the pine trees, but you could, you could be kind of scholarly with your values and you could be grouping these and manipulating those. For example, I could have done like a last kiss of sunlight on those trees and shifted the value, or maybe I could just shift the color. So here you could think about if somebody's new to painting, the silhouette makes sense and you could see the no two intervals the same as to the dark trees. And that makes sense. When we talk about grouping and splitting value, this is when, I mean, I could see it in class, you know, people kind of tune out or, oh yeah, what was that? Okay, what, wait, what was the value thing? So this idea of same value shift the color is kind of a big deal. And this is where I'm at. I'm, I feel like I'm learning about this too. And other artists have talked about this. John F. Carlson talks about this. Andrew Loomis talks about this. And uh, you better believe that Sargent and Edgar Payne were painting this way too. They knew about their value groupings. So it's pretty strong stuff. And there's a lot that you can learn from this. You can see to the right that I have uh, snapped that into black and white just to uh, let people see how those things are relating to each other. And then the lower, uh, the lower left is just an oil study that I did on location. And I just thought it would be fun to see the watercolor and the oil. Since I am basically working in both, it's kind of fun to see that differential. 
Okay, so I want to point a couple of things out here to folks uh, because I think this is a really good lesson as well. If you have the reference photo, that's where you stood and painted. Yes, that's the plein air study. Yeah. And then to the left is the plein air study. But I want everybody to pay close attention. See how dark the trees are in the photo. This is what photos do. Photos darken darks. Uh, and you don't get the color and texture in the transparency in the darks. If you look to the left, that's more like what Christine saw. Is that correct? That's exactly right, Eric. And I could see into the shadows. And therefore, if you know a lot about your values, then you could write to yourself, the shadows were a value eight or the shadows were a value seven. And then that, with that note, that's going to help you to make a bigger painting out of that. Yeah, I, that's why plein air painting is so important. Exactly. And also, when you go bigger, if you know the idea of same value shift the color, that's just going to help you tremendously because then when you have like acreage to cover with your brush, you know that by shifting the color, it's going to add a richness to the painting. And it gives you a lot of freedom because then there's no such thing as mixing the wrong color, but there is such a thing as mixing the wrong value. And the reason for that is that the human eye just sees value before anything else. And honestly, it took me a long time to understand that. I feel like I had to have that drummed into my brain. And, and it's, it's a slice of humble pie to think that you know everything there is about value, but be going back to the drawing board, so to speak, and learning about this. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to bring up also the uh, Blue Skies Over Paris value example, because that shows an addition, thank you, some pairings you could see with the letters the top and you might not believe that this is just black and white because that blue is so striking this is where optically value can kind of trick your brain into thinking that you need to do more to it so I the, yeah I would it when I first I looked at that the sky looks to me my brain is saying that blue in between those clouds is a lot lighter but when you look at the value study or the gradation of it, it's not that much, it's not, it's darker than it, my brain tells me it is. Yeah, and I get away with all types of stuff happening in the sky because in part that cloud is dark. If I'd had a lot of, let's say white dots in the sky, imagine cotton balls stuck all over that because that's what I saw when I was on location, but I wanted the viewer to be drawn to the bridge. So that's the area of higher contrast and therefore to, to keep some of the busy in the sky, but to optically calm it down, I used same value shift the color, which you can see with regard to A and B. And that's, wow. on, if anybody's watching on their phone, that's on the upper left in the sky area, because it's a little hard to see if you're, <laughs> if you're on the phone. And then surprisingly, the sky is in that medium range, like you said, um, but towards the horizon, and the highlights of the clouds I have as C, but you can see that the colors, the cubes in Photoshop C and D are one is warm and the other is cool. And so sometimes, so this is, this is where you wanna go. The closer your value pairings and the closer that you are, the, the closer you can move your values and the closer you can group and organize things, the stronger your design usually will be and the better your choices and then a magic thing can happen where if you put a mark down let's say I was going to add something to that blue sky and I put a mark down if your value is on target and it's organized and the viewer is seeing it clearly if you put a brush mark down and it's wrong you think oh no because it jumps the value and it's just it it looks out of control <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of fun. I, I've had that happen on a big painting. Like, what? What did I do? So anyway, that's kind of neat. Well, that's why we have a lifetime of challenges. We keep learning more and more things. Yeah, exactly. That's it. And we want to be learning more and more things for sure, for sure. Okay. Okay. So now we're into the, so we've talked about point number four, which is value groups and also value equality. And I have those broken out as concept four and concept five. 
but in truth, they really go hand in hand. And and talking about jumping value, if this was my painting and this was my structure, if I jump this value in here, this is what I'm talking about. Whereas let's say I wanna add something to the road or maybe if this is a river, a rock in the river, and I add something here, even if it's more tonal, that just quite simply means it stands out. And it's, it's a point in a field of light. And so I, I can't really do that without breaking into that plane. Usually it's better to, if I have a rock, you could group that value. So link it to another shape instead of having a bunch of, of polka dots. That's mm -hmm. quite simply what grouping means. Okay. And we're going to be looking at grouping a little bit more. I, speaking of rocks, I thought that would be kind of helpful for uh, folks who are going to be going to the plein air convention because I'm very excited about that. That's, going well, to be that's right. You're going to be you're going to be on the big stage. Yeah, I'm so excited about oh. the plein air convention. You know, you've be... arrived when you're on the big stage. You do know that, right? <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to that. Oh my goodness, it's going to be yeah. great. It's going to be a lot of fun. If people can't attend in person, uh, you can, you'll can you see the big stage uh, on our virtual version. Hey, Christine, would you just touch on real quick, go back to that other image real quickly. Uh, yeah, somebody sure. talked about this yesterday on the show, and I think this would be a good time to reinforce it. Talk about connecting darks. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, if Well, I could do a couple of things on this, which is... For example, if if uh, if we didn't care about anything that was up here, um, if I was going to connect some darks, I can I can shift. This is what I was talking about with shift the color but maintain the value. So now I could have a mountainous area in the background because we're in Tuscany, Eric. Yep, we are. We're about to be, and and, and everybody this, should squint because again that value will fool you but if you squint down it's it's pretty close to the same dark value that's exactly right and uh what what i'd like to show you i think it will be good for people that are i'd like to show you the example um this is if we if we have time i'd like to show you just really simply the version of the um the stream example that I had, the Potomac reflection stream yeah, example. Just push that pad over to the left a little bit. You can move your watercolor thing a little to the left if you want. There you go. Bring it down okay. just a touch. There we go. Okay. So you can see how I've I've parsed out my groupings here, and I thought we could work on that together and do just a really simple rock formation and how that would reflect. I thought that would be handy for people to be able to see that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll work in this area. You can see that, right? Yep. Good. Okay. Basically I'm, I'm, when I'm on location and I'm thinking about uh, what to paint and I'm in watercolor, I usually start light. And I would be thinking about this idea of the zigzag of the shore. But if I, I'm, I'm already, and this will answer some questions about people who think that watercolor is hard because I'm already in trouble if I'm not thinking about this in accordance with value. I have grouped my shapes of this main rock with this one over to the left. And so there are a reference I, image or you're just making this up in your head. I, I'm doing the if you want to switch to the Potomac reflections, that's what I'm go, I'm going to be painting for people today. Exactly. And obviously that's a 2436 painting. So we're not going to cover that in a little five by six demo here, but we're going to try. OK. OK. So when I'm doing that, I would hedge my bets and I would just tap out. And this was just some burnt umber. And what I've done is I've lifted the value off and I've offered a little bit of variegation. 
Plus, I might. Wait, 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 wait. You're talking Chinese here. Oops, I didn't mean <laughs> to make that. So what do you mean you lifted off the value? So I had put on a rather, let's just do it again here. I put on kind of a stronger color, but I know that basically that is, let me just, I, had, I have my value chart here. I'm after the lighter value range and therefore I want to just tap out. And this is why I find watercolor so handy sketching on location because it allows me to just remove that value as needed. Here we go, just showed up. So I wanna stay in this grouping for my light value because you should really be thinking about light medium, and then dark. And we'll get to that in just a minute for designing your image. I was out painting with CW Monday one day and uh, he said, we can't do a painting here. I only see two values. He says, I gotta <laughs> have at least three values. Yeah, but there's, I, I, I don't know. It's possible to do two values, but think of what we're talking about, Eric here. 10 values, right? Most people would say, yes, we have 10 values. So think about going to an art store and seeing all of those colors. And then somebody tells you that really you should only be thinking about value. So all of a sudden, instead of all those paint tubes, now you have only 10 options. And then if you take those away and I tell you, you have light, medium, and dark. This is why people don't really wanna talk about value because that's boring to have so few choices. Yeah. But this, no. but you try to, you. do you ever try to compress your values? In other words, will you do like a, if you're doing a tonal painting, you might have more medium and dark values rather than light values, or you always try to get uh, light, medium, and dark? Uh, light, medium, and dark is grouping and compressing your values. For example, yeah. if compressing your values means that instead of having this run the full 10, spectrum that I've grouped this into this uh, this value for all of the cubes like I've, I've chosen this one instead of all of these yeah um, and so you know they might not be a hundred percent perfect but, but they're light medium and dark it's light, medium, and dark, and instead of having it go to all 10 cubes, it's good if you can keep them organized into only three, and you can just, you can pick which three you want. So this is how I would sketch if I was on location. I'm thinking about this as my light shape, and then also I know it, it gives you a lot of freedom to paint faster, too, because I could have, then I could have my cerulean, and oh, that is... What is that gonna be? I want this to work with that value. So then again, I lift out, just do some lifting out. Plus I could do things like add some color in there, some peach color or some purple color in preparation with my sky. And why is that? Because it's going to be the same same value, but I've shifted the color. So that just gives me some leeway as to how this is going to work. Next up, I'm going to do some shadow for the rocks. So for this rock shadow, just coming in. And now that this has dried a little bit. And I do think about value while I'm painting. I have tried to think more about value while I'm painting. And as I said before, I am trying to educate myself about how to manipulate value. And 
I think it's easy to overlook the possibilities that value has to offer. If, if you take any image that strikes your fancy in a museum and you, nowadays with your phone, you can just pull that right up into black and white. And if you do that with any image, it's really interesting to look at the underlying pattern that is happening with regard to black and white. Yeah, that's a good thing to do with a sketch pad too, is just to, to do a value study on something you're looking at. That's exactly right. And I have avoided doing studies. One thing that has been helpful to me and the way that I'm kind of getting around some of my aversion to doing studies is I like to do these little watercolor, they're like doodles, yeah. little watercolor, playful doodles. So whatever you need to do to trick yourself into trying things out, because I can add stuff and take it away because I don't have to work in black and white. I could work in color or I could work as you saw in my really crude example. You can start out tonally and then shift to color. All of those things are possible with watercolor. And so that's what I've found. That's been kind of the key for me to end up playing. And I also like just what the spontaneity of watercolor has to offer. Some of the merging colors, as I, as I showed just briefly before with the little dabs, and you can see that happening here. Now, here's my chance to add some variety. And I do have all the same green. Sometimes when I paint with, so, so this is all similar. Now I'm gonna make it a bit more varied and I'm gonna add light and shadow. And so this, here's what we need to understand. Well, I'm gonna put water here, but this green is, I think you can see how these are the same value. So those two are gonna be the same value. So I'm, I'm trying for a shift in color, but the same value. That's a very important lesson. It is, and it's easy to gloss that over like, oh, yep, I got it. Now I'm gonna go paint. Um, well, try looking for pairs in the landscape. That is pairings meaning where do things match up? Is this shadow the same color as that? That will give you a lot of control. That's something you can make a note of. You can also turn form with value. Most definitely. And it's really great for portraits. I'm getting ready to take the Portrait Society conference and uh, I can't wait to be looking for color temperature changes. And it's gonna be really great. Yeah, that's a good group of people. So now that I'm introducing this shadow shape, oh, the other really cool thing, Eric, is that by, by doing just what you're talking about, shifting that color and turning the form, it means that it optically looks like more is going on in your painting than there really technically is, because it seems like by doing this that we've simplified or you know, reduced the impact. But in fact, the opposite is true what is happening now is this tree looks extra bright in the sun. I can add a little, some texture there. And all of a sudden, oh, maybe that was too much texture. Uh, all of a sudden it, it looks, it gets, just gives you more power. And it's pretty neat to think it's just from knowing your values. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Okay, so why don't we do this? We're going to have to wrap up. But uh, how about you just give us a quick reminder of what the five points are? Sure. So the five points are going to be no equal intervals. A second is Z versus C. And then we need to employ fade or shift. And we need to also be thinking about number four, value groupings, where you lump things together into light, medium, or dark. And then number five is value equality or same value, but shift the color. This has been fab. Thanks, Eric. This is fab.
This is so much fun. I just love watching people paint, especially people who paint <laughs> well. And I've never seen you paint in watercolor. I know. It's um it's really fun. Watercolor is just so fast. And you can just bang out all of these different ideas and just try different stuff. And sometimes um like on location, I'll just if I'm if I'm feeling rusty or you know, I'm not quite sure where to start with something, I might just bring out my watercolor because that just lets me play, it lets me get back to a fun place of trying some different stuff out. Well, the other thing I've discovered, uh, because watercolor is fairly new in my life since Watercolor Live, really. And when I'm out plein air painting and I'm, you know, sometimes you're in a place where you want to do like five paintings, but you don't have time. For instance, when I was in New Zealand, I was in this incredible spot. Uh, I, I went with the idea of try to get more studies than finished paintings because I wanted to paint as much variety as possible. But when I ran out of time, I still had time to whip out a couple of quick watercolors. And so well, I just keep the watercolor there with me. That is fantastic. That's exactly what you want to be doing. And it just, it makes such a difference when you can just do a quick study. It's, a, it's kind of, I think it just helps you calm down that you don't have to do everything all at once and it fosters playtime. That's what we want to do. It's just foster some playtime. Yeah, I love all the lessons in this, the variety. Why don't you come back on screen and say goodbye? Eric, this has been lots of fun. Thanks for working through value with me. Oh, this has been a great lesson, Christine. Thank you for doing it today. Yeah. Uh, you're a great inspiration. We will see you at the Plein Air Convention. And uh, we're excited. It's going to be uh, going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I can't wait to meet everybody and paint in person. And what a gorgeous location. Yeah. So You've thanks been, for all you, you do. Been, and thanks for everybody for tuning in. You've been before, right? Uh, not to Denver, no. No, but you've been to the Plein Air Convention. Yes, I've been to the convention. Yeah, sure I have. So. Yeah. It's lots of fun. Lots of fun. Well, this is the only time we're going to do Denver. So this is a good time. If you live close to Denver and you can drive, do it. Do it. Okay, Christine, thank you. Thank you. All, All right. right. Happy painting, everybody.